Hi, welcome to all of you. I'm so pleased to see you at the Marconi Society's Decade of Digital Inclusion event series. Today, we're kicking off our very first virtual tract, the 6G Summit on Connecting the Unconnected. For those of you who are meeting us for the first time, the Marconi Society is a nonprofit dedicated to ensuring that the opportunities of the network are available to everyone on the planet. I'm the Marconi Society's Executive Director, Samantha Shartman, and our chair, who you will have the privilege of hearing from today, is Vince Cerf, one of the creators of the internet and leading visionaries of our time. The event series that you're joining today is bringing together leaders in technology, policy, and digital inclusion. Our goal is to create conversations and collaborations that will help us bring the un- and underconnected online in a way that is accessible, affordable, safe, and engaging. Next slide, please. We are proud and honored to have some incredible sponsors for this event, who we are dedicated um, as we are, who, who are as dedicated as we are to ensuring digital inclusion. I'd particularly like to acknowledge our top sponsors, Cisco, Crown Castle, and Seagrid and Vint Surf. So thank you to those three. Next slide. But they're not the only sponsors today. These organizations that you see here and people have supported our event series in so many ways. The breadth of our sponsors is one of the best testaments to the interdisciplinary nature of this event and the opportunity we are going to address. Next slide. So because of the generosity of our sponsors, this allows us to offer tickets for the entire six week event series. It is going to feature 75 experts. There are 17 total sessions, including this one, and it's only $49 for the general public and $25 for students. So if you haven't registered yet, please, I hope you will do so today. Um, you can head over to marconisociety.org slash decade to, uh, to do so, and you can find a way to, to register for all of our future events. So thank you so much. I'm going to turn it over to Professor Mohamed Slip Alumi of KAUST, who will kick off our session. Thank you so much, Slip. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Samantha, for this uh, nice introduction. Let me start by uh, welcoming uh, all our uh, delegates uh, who are attending online the 6G Summit. I would like also to acknowledge our local uh, sponsors, uh, KAUST, of course, uh, uh, the Marconi Society, CITC, uh, WWRF, and Frontiers. Uh, the way uh, uh, this uh, summit is going to go, uh, we'll have three days each uh, of roughly an hour and a half. Today it will be a little bit longer because we have some opening remarks. Uh, and uh, at the same, we'll start at the same time and we'll hear from really some of the main voices, some of the main brains working in this area of uh, digital, uh, connect, uh, digital divide and connectivity divide. Uh, for today, uh, uh, we'll start with an uh, opening session with some opening remarks by myself, uh, Dr. Vin Cerf, Dr. Taufir Jalasi. Then we'll hear from four speakers and we'll conclude our session with a panel uh, on um, basically some of the possibilities uh, that are out there to connect the unconnected. So uh, let me start by uh, sharing my screen and uh, uh, giving uh, some, uh, uh, okay, I, I hope you all see my screen. Okay, so what I would like to highlight in my opening remarks that uh, connecting the remaining 4 billion should be viewed not only as a research for us, a uh, researcher in, in the field of wireless communication, but of course, uh, also an opportunity for the future communities and societies. So uh, as you know, uh, as we are deploying uh, 5G worldwide, uh, uh, we, as again, a community of research and wireless communication have started already brainstorming about uh, uh, the next generation of wireless communication. So and here we are talking about beyond 5G and 6G, uh, which are expected to be uh, deployed by the early 2030s. So, of course, uh, many of us are always very motivated by 
pushing the envelope type of uh, research, uh, uh, which means we're going for higher speed, lower latency, uh, more massive connectivity, uh, connectivity anywhere, anytime. But, uh, and, and this is of course uh, a, a topic that has been, uh, I would say, uh, 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 researched by, uh, or uh, uh, there have been many perspective paper on this topic over the last uh, couple of years. However, uh, what we would like to focus on uh, in uh, uh, this uh, SIGG summit is uh, what uh, what is motivated by what we are seeing here in the map in front of you. So obviously, it goes without saying that we do, we do suffer from serious gaps in global uh, internet uh, uh, connectivity, uh, and we tend indeed to forget that we still have about half of the world population, uh, this number of about 4 billion people that are still lacking internet connectivity, and it's expected that 5G, or at least in its current initial deployment, uh, is going to further accentuate this digital divide. This is the well-known Matthew effect, where basically the rich get richer and unfortunately the poor get poorer. And the COVID-19 pandemic has shown that uh, obviously uh, uh, um, uh, connectivity divide is becoming in a way uh, the modern face of uh, inequality. And uh, the reasons are many. So uh, there are, of course, some social reasons like uh, lack of uh, computer literacy, uh, some uh, lack of... Uh, uh, knowledge of the language being used on the internet, of more generally lack of, uh, let's say, uh, relevant uh, local content uh, that make uh, people uh, not really motivated to connect uh, uh, to the internet. But there are also some technical and economical reasons. So let me highlight uh, two of them. The first one is obviously uh, the mobile network operator work on a return on investment type of model. And uh, while they uh, invest quite a bit of money to acquire spectrum, uh, to, uh, to buy some capital equipment, uh, eventually it doesn't make much business sense for them to lay hundreds if not thousands of kilometers of fiber optics uh, to reach some uh, you know, low, uh, 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 sparsely populated, let's say, rural areas. Uh, uh, so that's one reason for behind this digital divide. But also uh, there is, of course, this uh, important aspect, which is uh, this correlation between the lack of connectivity and the lack of a power grid. We have, of course, to remember that to have a reliable uh, telecom network, we need to rely on a reliable uh, power grid. And many of the developing countries, unfortunately, either they don't have a power grid in, in some areas or if that power grid is there, it's basically uh, uh, you know, not reliable. And by the way, the square divide is not touching only rural areas in developing countries or sometimes even in developed countries. It, it can reach or it can touch, let's say, the heart of uh, so the mega cities, here we're talking about slums or favelas, where basically affordability can become the main issue. Basically, if the, uh, we are dealing with a situation where we have a low expected revenue, calculate as an average revenue per user, this well-known ARPU, uh, if we have a low ARPU, this reduces the appetite of companies and their willingness to invest uh, 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 in these uh, areas. So uh, obviously uh, the objective of the summit is to, to kind of uh, talk about ways to bridge the digital divide. Uh, so if we are able to provide high quality global connectivity, we can essentially and or say hopefully break this vicious digital divide and enable uh, richer and uh, denser communities to share their knowledge and as such strengthen the economies of less fortunate and more sparsely populated communities. In other words, we'll offer, uh, you know, the often economically and socially isolated for billion who are currently either unconnected or underconnected, uh, the experience uh, that comes with, or the benefits that come with uh, connectivity from access to better healthcare, uh, from access to better education remotely, uh, to smart farming, to new jobs, as well, of course, to real-time banking and a variety of financial services. So in my view, to achieve digital inclusiveness, we develop what we can call thrifty wireless network solution based on low cost backhaul. And we'll hear tomorrow about some aerial and space solution uh, in today, uh, tomorrow panel. We would like also to see low cost access solution uh, uh, tomorrow, uh, not more Thursday, we'll be hearing about some uh, uh, low cost access solutions that are being deployed. And then of course, we would like to rely on low cost or standard smartphone, tablet or tablet to reap the benefit of uh, the economy of, of scale. So um, let me now uh, 
in the remaining, let's say, few minutes, highlight some research that uh, we have done here at CAOS over the last year, since uh, the last uh, or the first uh, 6G summit on Connected and Connected. One thing we have done is to, to try to come up with, let's say, a, a, a metric to quantify uh, at a high resolution this connectivity divide. So as you know, uh, there are some, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, ways to quantify uh, the telecommunication service uh, uh, imbalance uh, at the country level. I'm talking here, for example, about GCMA mobile connectivity index or the inclusive internet index. But these, again, they are provided at the country-wise level. What we were after is a high resolution, let's say 20 kilometer, 20 kilometer type of hexagon uh, uh, and uh, that, um, you know uh, um, database to be able to basically uh, uh, get an idea about this uh, uh, imbalance at this level of resolution. And the, the key here, without getting into technical details, is to access to two open access uh, databases. The first one is the open cell ID database, which gives uh, you know how base stations are distributed worldwide, as well as the high resolution Facebook connectivity lab density population. And with that, to make a long story short, we were able to develop uh, this uh, index that quantifies the level of imbalance. So here's just taking as an example, the country of Uganda, where clearly around big cities like the capital Kampala, uh, the situation is relatively good. But then as soon as you get into deep rural area within Uganda, obviously you suffer from uh, deep uh, digital divide as illustrated by the red and orange type of hexagons. Now we did the same thing for a country like the US, obviously the situation is much, much better. However, we still see uh, in a country like the US still some pocket of digital divide in some area in the Midwest uh, uh, where you see quite a bit of red and orange. So uh, if you want uh, more information about this project, I invite you to visit this website and uh, to read more in this technical paper that has been uh, uh, published uh, recently in IEEE. Uh, and you can interactively check uh, for your country of your choice about the level of digital connectivity. So that's kind of direction number one, which was about uh, characterizing digital divide. Let me now uh, give you an overview of some of the ideas that we are proposing to, let's say, help uh, bridge the digital divide. One idea is to use an aerial solution, in particular UAV. So this paper with uh, 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 my PhD students, Moiru Matrashia, and uh, my postdoc in my group, uh, Dr. Mostafa Kishk, we developed this uh, framework based on stochastic geometry, where we shown that if you use UAVs to basically help or assist rural communities, we are able to improve coverage area quite a bit. So the model is very simple. Uh, we assume that uh, within a city, we have uh, a high number of base stations and uh, as such, you know, coverage is secured. But as you move away from downtown, uh, basically this decrease and we assume an exponential decrease in the density of base station. And as such, you will suffer from certain digital divide. But uh, to compensate for that, we are adding some drones to help basically connect the unconnected in these rural areas. To make a long story short, these are the kind of results that we're able to obtain. So as a benchmark, you can see this blue curve that's acting as lower bound. That is basically illustrating the coverage probability as functional distance from the town center or downtown, let's say, without any drone uh, assistance. And then you see, obviously, as you move away from downtown, uh, basically your coverage probability decreased Quite, uh, quite fast. Now, as, as soon as you start injecting some uh, drones into your network, obviously you start recovering in terms of coverage, and the more drones you put, the better is your coverage. The second and last topic I would like to highlight is that basically if we use, uh, uh, remember one of the issues I was highlighting is this issue of uh, uh, lack of power. Uh, in some of the rural areas. And the idea that Morillo proposed in this paper is basically to attach base station to wind turbine. So the wind turbine will not be only a source of, let's say, a power in rural area, but also will be source of uh, providing uh, 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 telecom services. And uh, uh, of course, where should we place uh, uh, these uh, uh, turbine and base station? It will be in areas where we have favorable wind statistics. We did some studies in Western France, Southern Argentina, and even Ethiopia. So let me here uh, highlight what we have seen in Argentina, where obviously uh, the, the, the turbine were not placed from a coverage perspective. It was like a wind turbine farm. So we had to propose some extra location for wind turbine to which we attached some base station. And what we showed is that obviously uh, uh, doing that 
we can improve considerably the data rates. So uh, uh, solving the fact that uh, you can get access to power rural areas and providing connectivity at the same time. So these are some of the highlights of some of the work being done uh, at KAUST in, in this area. And uh, I'm sure over the coming uh, three days, we'll hear about a lot of research being done in some research groups in industry and academia about reaching the chief divide. So with that, uh, I conclude my opening remarks and we are all here hopefully to, uh, let's say, fulfill this uh, interesting and prophetic, uh, let's say, a statement made by Nikola Tesla more than 100 years ago. Uh, and uh, I would like now uh, to give the floor to our uh, second uh, uh, speaker in this opening session, uh, Dr. Uh, Wint uh, Surf. So uh, uh, let me introduce uh, uh, Dr. Wint Surf. Obviously, Wint uh, needs no introduction. Uh, as Samantha mentioned, he's the chairman of the Marconi Society and the vice president and chief internet evangel evangelist of Google USA. Uh, he is widely known as the father of the internet. Uh, and uh, he, as you know, he's the co-designer of the TCP IP protocol and the architecture uh, of the internet. So this is just a very brief introduction for, for Vint who doesn't need an introduction. Uh, so Vint, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, you are muted Vint. That's, that's probably the most common expression in the last 18 months is you're muted. That's but right. Thank you yeah. for, for reminding me. Uh, but, and thank you for the introduction. By the way, I'm not the only father of the internet. There are a lot of them. Uh, I'm just happy to have been one of them. Uh, it takes uh, a lot of people to make anything of this scale actually happen. Uh, so the first thing is you've already uh, brought up some very important points. If you're going to try to improve internet infrastructure and connectivity, you have to know where it isn't. Uh, and you also have to know where is it not functioning adequately. So those high resolution measurements are very important. What's interesting about uh, those measurements, however, is that uh, unless you do it right, you may actually get um, results that are confusing because for example, in a residential setting where people are using Wi-Fi, it could be that the Wi-Fi arrangement is poorly matched to the connectivity uh, of that residence or office building to the internet service provider. And so distinguishing between poor performance that is the result of inadequate Wi-Fi configuration and uh, inadequate access uh, to the internet turns out to be very important because you could reach uh, incorrect conclusions without doing that uh, properly. Uh, at Google, about 10 years ago, we started a project we called Measurement Lab or MLab. Uh, it's now housed in the Code for Science and Society, uh, but Google continues to be an active participant in collecting data from speed tests that individual users can run. When they run those tests, we ask them to uh, confirm that we can take that data and accumulate it in a publicly available database uh, for others to, uh, to analyze the measurement. Uh, I'm sorry, the Marconi Society is participating with, uh, uh, with this program, developing new tools for the evaluation and analysis of the collected data. We have many terabytes of information accumulated over the past decade or so. Uh, you also uh, implicitly mentioned electrical power, and I guess it's very important for everybody to keep in mind that if you don't have any electricity, it's really hard to run anything associated with the internet. The equipment tends not to work. So, uh, of course, uh, there are places that don't have reliable electrical power, and for that we rely on batteries that can be charged in one place and then used elsewhere. Uh, and we do see that happening. Uh, in various parts of the world where electricity is not reliably available. But in the long run, uh, we need electrification as well as connectivity uh, to the internet. Uh, what we have been seeing, of course, is that the internet isn't useful unless it runs well. And so uh, in the course of doing all these various measurements, uh, we discovered, for example, Wi-Fi configuration is a challenge. There's also a phenomenon called buffer bloat, which has to do with the way in which the uh, buffers of the routers that interconnect the users to the public internet, uh, those, buf those buffers can potentially be misconfigured in a way that creates a, a very slow and sluggish uh, behavior of the system. And that's a matter of configuration. Uh, and in, the, uh, in the end, though, um, in the, we, in addition to doing good engineering, uh, we also have to see how powerful wireless has become as an access method 
to the internet. We can see the telephone system going, as you implied, from 3G to 4G, and now 5G, and someday 6G. We're still debating some of the details. Uh, Wi-Fi came uh, sort of in the middle of all that uh, as an extension of local area networking and ethernet techniques on coaxial cables. And now more uh, recently, uh, we're seeing a substantial initiative to put low earth orbiting satellites up in place. Again, another wireless uh, access method, which uh, if it goes as the um, uh, promoters of the low earth orbit satellite communication are saying, will make it impossible to avoid, ac avoid access to the internet because these tens of thousands of satellites will be literally able to reach every square inch of the earth, not only the land mass, but also uh, the oceans as well. Uh, so that's the, the connectivity that we anticipate um, is uh, significant. The problem, of course, uh, that you alluded to is that it may not be affordable, uh, either because of the equipment costs or the actual business model of the uh, provider of uh, access to internet. And so we need to find ways of driving cost out. We may need to turn to government regulation in order to provide subsidies for people who otherwise couldn't afford access. And there's a good reason for doing that. It's because the value of the internet comes uh, partly as a result of the number of people who are able to get access to it. And my uh, honest belief is that until everyone is available, until the internet is available to everyone, we will not have extracted the value that it's capable of supplying. So uh, I look forward to the day when we can say that 100% of the world's population has access to the internet if it wants it. Uh, just two other things uh, to mention. When, uh, when the uh, typical providers of high-speed uh, internet service offer either fiber to the home or coaxial cable or hybrid fiber uh, coax, at some point, they often find that it's no longer economically feasible to use those technologies to uh, to connect people. And so we see uh, a lot of opportunity for wireless ISPs to form. Sometimes they're cooperative, sometimes they're just small businesses. Uh, but the idea there is that they can extend access to the internet uh, further and locally. You mentioned drones. Uh, and of course, there are some issues associated with drones, not the least of which is the longevity of a drone. How long can, can, can it stay up? How much weight can it carry? Uh, you know, it needs batteries not only for uh, to be held in the air, but it needs battery power in order to deliver uh, internet service. Uh, Google uh, or Alphabet, the holding company, did try to do that with uh, balloons, um, untethered balloons. The company was called Loon, and we almost got there. Uh, technologically, it worked, uh, but I think the engine, the economic engine that was needed in order to make it sustainable, didn't quite uh, uh, make it, and uh, and we ended that effort. Uh, but it's very clear uh, that there are many different alternative ways of getting there, wireless being a pretty diverse alternative. And so naturally, the Marconi Society is interested in that since uh, Mr. Marconi was responsible for bringing uh, the radio world uh, into commercial operation. So I'll stop there uh, and uh, turn this back over to Slim and look forward very much to the conversation that we will have as a panel. Slam, you're muted. Sorry, again. Okay, of course, we, we tend always to forget that, right? So um, uh, uh, thank you, Vint, for the very interesting opening remarks. Uh, let, uh, let us uh, now uh, give the floor uh, to the third uh, speaker in this opening session, Dr. Taufiq Jlasi, who is uh, now the Assistant Director General uh, for the Communication and Information Sector at UNESCO in Paris. Uh, Dr. Jelassi has extensive experience in higher education, scientific research, and information and, com uh, and communication technologies. Uh, he was uh, program director and professor of strategy and technology management at IMD Business School in Lausanne from 2015 to June 2021, and he joined in July 2021 UNESCO as a assistant director. And prior to that, he, he served in, 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 in many positions, including uh, as the Minister of Higher Education, Scientific Research, and Information Communication Technologies in Tunisia. So let us give the floor to Dr. Tafir Jalassi. First of all, I would like to thank the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology 
and Dr. Mohamed Slim Alwini for the kind invitation. I appreciate this opportunity to reflect on some of the broader considerations and principles to help guide future 6G development, speak, speaking both in a personal capacity and on behalf of UNESCO. The momentum to shape 6G standards is a global one. It spans institutions both in the global north and the global south, including research collaborations such as the ones undertaken by your university and other similar high-level research institutions all over the world. This global knowledge exchange and multi-stakeholder consultation based on open science principles is the key driver of transformative digital innovation to support sustainable development. It is clear that 6G, while not clearly defined yet, will be able to dramatically enhance and empower other digital architectures and technologies. These include machine learning, autonomous networks, robotics, and the Internet of Things, as well as 6G for cloud computing and edge computing, decentralized blockchain applications, and quantum computations. We'll even see 6G being associated with augmented human intelligence as researchers seek to integrate the human mind with real-time computational power through wearable and implanted micro devices. We all agree about the transformative impact of these technologies on a 6G backbone. However, we must assert the need for a human right based and ethical navigation and reflection within our technical communities. The, the, the realization of 6G requires key institutions and actors to advocate a multi-stakeholder approach for digital development that can drive innovation being open, more inclusive, universally accessible, and respectful of human rights. You may be aware that UNESCO has a history of promoting a human rights-based approach to science and technology while fostering international dialogue and ethical reflection on these issues. This coming November, the 193 member states of UNESCO will discuss and hopefully approve two international normative instruments, one on the ethics of AI and the other on open science. The rights-based governance of technology also brings us back to foundational and internationally agreed upon human rights values including those developed through the United Nations. Being the UNESCO Assistant Director General for Communication and Information, my remit includes the promotion of freedom of expression and universal access to information, both online and offline. Since 2015, our work on internet development has been guided by the internet universality principles which were endorsed by the 193 member states of UNESCO. These principles are called the Rome guiding principles. You have this on the slide, R standing for rights-based, O for open, A for accessible, and M for multi-stakeholder, while also considering X meaning cross-cutting issues such as gender equality, that should also be taken into account. These Rome principles guide our approach to internet governance, but also the development of technologies surrounding internet networks, notably artificial intelligence. Internet universality calls for a networked connectivity model that is accessible and inclusive of, to all stakeholders, while also including considerations of rights-based and ethical dimensions of AI. Rome is a practical compass, which includes key considerations for the future of 6G, 
which should apply a human rights-based approach to openness, ensure accessibility, and the multi-stakeholder with gender-sensitive approach, which I mentioned earlier. Ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate this opportunity to share with you some thoughts and information on the principles and practical tools that may guide technological advances into the future. In particular, I hope that the ethical and human rights-based dimensions of science and technology, as well as the internationally agreed upon normative foundations and practical toolkits that UNESCO developed, I hope that these will be of interest to you in your future work. In this spirit, I look forward to continuing such dialogue with you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jelassi, for these uh, interesting uh, remarks. So now we move to the uh, uh, panel, uh, uh, and we'll start the panel with basically four uh, uh, speakers uh, who will give their point of view or their vision on this uh, uh, topic. And then we'll move to the Q&A, or let's say, or the discussion part of the panel. So in this panel, uh, we have four distinguished speakers. Uh, Milo Medin, who is the Vice President of Wireless Service at Alphabet, Paul Garnett, who is the, the CEO of Ver Vernon Berg Group in USA, uh, Elizabeth Belding, who is Professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and Aida Jarro, who is a Senior Liaison Officer uh, of ITU uh, in the uh, to the United Nations uh, uh, in New York City and USA too. So uh, let's start with our first speaker, Milo Medin, and I'll give a very brief uh, kind of bio. Milo, as I mentioned, is the Vice President of Wireless Services at Alphabet. He has been part of the internet development community for more than uh, 25 years. He's currently the Vice President of Wireless Services at Alphabet, where he oversees the company's gigabit fiber to the home project and other efforts to improve access to the internet. Milo, the floor is yours. You can uh, uh, basically unmute yourself. All right, thank you. Um... Let me start by saying something that may be obvious to many of you, but an important part of the conversation about what 6G and 5G, for that matter, really means. That is that the speed of wireless data flows depends on a large part on how wide the channel or spectrum uh, being used is. The wider the channel, the higher speed uh, a user can enjoy and the higher capacity that sector can deliver overall. Going to multiple base station sites can increase total system capacity through increased frequency reuse, but peak speeds that a user can get are still driven by how wide the channel is. One of the big changes from LTE to release 15 5G was increasing the total spectrum a single user can use from 100 megahertz to 500 megahertz, and 6G will increase that even more. Of course, that only helps if you can bring additional spectrum to bear in actual deployments. Without that, 5G and 6G will only bring a modicum of performance improvements. Large amounts of new spectrum are not available at lower frequencies, but only higher ones. Reallocating midband spectrum uh, or spectrum above two gigahertz and below six gigahertz can yield a few hundred megahertz of spectrum. A lot more spectrum is available in, in the millimeter wave bands. But these higher frequencies do not propagate as well as lower ones and generally cannot penetrate indoors at all. So using these bands, even at higher power levels, requires many more base stations to be deployed than traditional macro cell networks. I was the co-author of a Pentagon report on 5G that was released in 2019. The unclassified version can be downloaded easily. Just search for Defense Innovation Board 5G report and Google should find it for you. In that study, we used a set of tools inside Google that leverages our enormous geospatial data and cloud compute resources to model how many base stations would be needed to deliver 100 megabits to a single user at the edge of the sector to about 70% of the US population. Uh, in contrast, while microcell networks you know, operating in the US can cover like more than 90% of US population with just about 50,000 base stations at UHF frequencies, Three gigahertz spectrum would need over a million base stations to cover more than 70% of POPs and more than 13 million base stations at millimeter wave spectrum because of these differences in propagation. This is not just about space on poles uh, or on rooftops and power. It's really about fiber deployment. 
which is needed to backhaul that data to the rest of the internet. There is really only one network, the wired one, with a little bit of wireless at the edge. You can't be a leader in 5G or 6G without being a leader in fiber deployment. A good measure of, how, of, of this uh, in a country is about how many fiber to the home service customers a country has. Because if the fiber goes that deep for residential access, it can also serve to trunk smaller and smaller cell radiuses that higher frequency spectrum uh, requires. By the way, China is the clear leader here. Last data I saw was that in the first quarter of 2021, China had more than 477 million fiber to the home customers, and the entire rest of the world was about 120 million. So in the end, 5G, and especially 6G, depends not just on spectrum available, but on the fiber optic infrastructure to backhaul that traffic to CDNs and cloud providers that are providing that data that wireless networks will consume. You can't be a leader in 6G or 5G without being a leader in fiber as well. Thank you. Back to you, Slim. Thanks a lot, Milo. Excellent uh, remarks. Uh, let us move now to the second speaker in our panel. Uh, and here uh, I would like to uh, invite uh, Paul Garnett, who's, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the CEO of Very Non Work Group uh, in the USA. Uh, prior, to, let me give a kind of a brief, uh, let's say, uh, bio to, uh, of Paul. So uh, prior to founding the Vernonburg Group, Paul was the senior director of Microsoft Airband Initiative. Uh, the Airband Initiative's portfolio encompassed over 100 projects in 20 countries across five continents, where Paul and his team work with internet service providers, energy access providers, and other partners to deploy new last mile access technologies, cloud-based services, and business models that extend broadband internet access for tens of millions of people. Paul, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, uh, Professor Alouini, for that, uh, that introduction. And uh, uh, hopefully um, what I'm about to say is it helps nice compliments what we've heard earlier from, from you and, and, and Milo and Vint uh, already. Um, so I'm going I'm to cover two quick topics uh, in, in my opening remarks. Uh, first of all, I just, I'm going to have a, just a, bit, a little bit of an overview of, of the broadband uh, connectivity landscape um, and, and the digital divide and, and the issue of digital inclusion. Um, and then I'm going to talk specifically about an idea uh, in relation to uh, something called environmental, social, and governance investing and, and the role that, that that can play in helping to close the global uh, broadband divide. Um, so just to start, uh, we know that um, half the world's um, population is, is not currently online. Um, and specifically, um, you know, what generates that statistic that's probably most often quoted is a questionnaire that basically asks whether or not an individual consumer has accessed the internet in the last 90 days. So not, not every day, just once in the last 90 days. So even among the, the, let's say half the world's population that's now online, there's some huge differences within that data set in terms of quality of, of, of connectivity and the experience that consumers are actually getting online. Um, but when one looks at all of the literature that's out there in, uh, in relation to um, digital inclusion and, and, and digital inequality, uh, what we see is that it disproportionately impacts people who are low income, uh, they're located in, in rural areas, in small island developing nations, and in landlocked developing countries. Um, they're often people who are lacking literacy and are lacking in digital skills. Um, and they are uh, from traditionally disenfranchised groups, um, such as women and girls, persons with disabilities, and ethnic minorities. Um, another thing to remember is that digital inequality persists around the world, regardless of what market you're in. So, you know, to use the example of New York City, um, Pretty much everyone in New York City has access to, to the internet and access to broadband. Um, but when it comes to fixed connectivity, a million and a half New Yorkers do not have uh, a, a fixed broadband connection at home, which is kind of amazing out of a population of eight and a half million people in, in, in uh, what one would think would be one of the most advanced cities on the planet. Um, the other thing that's interesting, what we've seen really over the last 30 years is um, those that are at the bottom uh, uh, are, are catching up in terms of the basics of internet access. So people are getting 3G mobile uh, internet connections. Um, they're starting to use those. 
Uh, they're getting access to public Wi-Fi hotspots. But where the divergence appears and is, is actually getting worse, is, as uh, as Slim, you mentioned earlier, is with regard to enhanced capabilities. So things like unlimited data consumption on a, on a high-speed mobile connection or, or having a fixed connect connection at home. Um, we're seeing a widening, wider and wider gap. Think of you know, the difference between 2G and, and 6G. You know, that when, when 6G gets introduced, there are still going to be people in the world who are on 2G or 3G connections. Um, and, the, and the other thing you mentioned earlier, Slim, uh, which is true, which is the COVID-19 the COVID pandemic has really, really sharpened our focus on the set of issues. And, you know, I think sometimes you don't want to let a, a, a good crisis go, go to waste um, in, in some respects. And this is an example where, you know, COVID-19 has really shown uh, in stark terms, you know, how, how bad these gaps can be. And the, the example that we often hear about is in education, where, where 1.6 billion school children were sent home from school around the world uh, who, do, who, who do not have connectivity at home. And think about what that means for their, their educational opportunities. They're expected to, to learn and, and online, and yet they don't even have an internet connection uh, in their homes. Um, so if you look at you know, the efficacy of, of efforts to date uh, with regard to digital inclusion, of course, there is a lot of progress that's, that's been made um, and you know, a lot of goals have been set. Um, so I don't, wanna, I don't wanna downplay any of that. Um, I, oftentimes what we see are the, the goals that are adopted, especially at the international level, do tend to be pretty much the, the least common denominator kind of goals. So things like, you know, everyone needs to have a 256 kilobit per second uh, fixed connection, um, isn't gonna do you much good when, when the rest of the world is a hundred megabit per second connection. Uh, or, or um, goals around around mobile connectivity, um, but even even at current projections and even using those 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 kind of goals, um, it's likely we're going to fall short of hitting targets, right? So if you look at the the broadband commission's goals for the next five years, um, it's likely that that those targets are not going to be met at current projections. So we've got to do something to change that trajectory. Um, uh, so we need to we need to increase the goals. We need to do more um, and. Uh, and, and if we do that, we can we can we can uh, achieve a lot. Um, and I think that we talked about some of these already, but the hurdles uh, are pretty well understood. Um, so uh, you look at um, what what the challenges that we all face, and I think we all understand what a lot, what a lot of those are. So we talked earlier about data, um, and and you know you really can't solve a problem you don't really understand. Uh, so the more data that we have at the high, higher, higher resolution, the better we can, we can address the challenges that we face. Um, things like regulatory uncertainty and fragmentation, if we can reduce that uncertainty, if we can reduce that fragmentation, do things at, the, at, at the, the regional or even global level, that can make a huge difference in terms of bringing technology to market. Access to financing is a huge issue, especially for, for, for companies that are just go, getting going in emerging markets. So what can we do to, to help to enable companies who have great ideas and are, are, uh, have great business models that can help to close the digital divide, um, get access to the finance that they need to grow. Um, just, just the lack of available infrastructure, deepening fiber in, into networks, as, as Milo said. Um, making services and technologies more affordable and more consumable. Um, increasing digital scaling and increasing literacy for that matter. Um, and also just making sure the content that is available is increasingly relevant to, to users. Um, and added to that, I think we also need to take a much broader view of, of available technologies and business and regulatory models. Then talked about some of those interesting uh, new fixed wireless technologies that are, that are, that are in the market today and, uh, and, and could be used to help address some of these challenges. And oftentimes we think too narrowly about what's, what's available um, uh, to address these issues. Um, and then I think just as a segue into the ESG, your environmental system and governance top, um, we really need to elevate um, digital inclusion uh, to the top of the global policy agenda. And of course, among ourselves, we all think it's really important. But if you get into a into a uh, you know a higher level discussion uh, with with world leaders or policymakers and looking across all the policies that they're trying to address, I think oftentimes our issues don't end up making making it to the top of the list. Um, and I think part of the part of the issue that really has gotten in the way uh, of that is there really is a lack of a groundswell um, of support in private sector 
to tackle this challenge. And I'm not just talking about network operators here. I think they do they do an awful lot. I'm talking about the broader private sector across all sectors, uh, not, not taking this as seriously as, as, as I think they should. So that brings me to this idea around um, ESG investing or environmental, social, and governance investing. So I think a lot of you have probably heard about uh, this recently. If you read any business section of any newspaper in the world, uh, there, is, there are increasingly stories about ESG investing and it's, it's often, more often than not in the context of, um, of uh, climate change and, uh, and, and directing investments and holding companies accountable for, for, uh, for helping to address climate change. But ESG arrest, investing has been around for 50 or 60 years, starting in the 60s, and, and initially was focused on things like you know, uh, divesting uh, investments in companies that do business with the South African apartheid regime uh, and, and, uh, and things like tobacco and other, other, other uh, socially important issues. Um, but if you look in the last, let's say five years, and certainly in the last two years, interest in ESG investing has really taken off. Um, and, and in particular, in the context of, um, of uh, addressing uh, climate change. Um, according to the Financial Times, ESG investments are currently thought to total about $32 trillion. Um, and, uh, and according to MSCI, which is, which is a, an, uh, an ESG index uh, provider, they project that over the next two or three decades, the millennial generation, which I'm not a member of, but I'm always proud of what the kind of things they do, um, alone could put uh, between 15 and $20 trillion into U.S. domicile ESG investments, which would doubly ruffle, doubly, would roughly double the size of the U.S. equity market. Um, uh, so while efforts to address climate change definitely get the most attention in ESG ratings, uh, ESG ratings do look at a wide range of socially important issues. Um, another thing to remember about ESG investing is it's both carrot and stick. So it, it's meant to put some pressure on companies to do things differently, but it also is meant to give companies credit for the things they are doing already uh, to help address um, uh, major social and economic issues. Um, and, and as you probably have seen, uh, major financial institutions have, have pledged to make ESG investing uh, a, 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 a central part of, of, of their investment um, activity. So that brings me back to the issue of digital inequality and digital inclusion. And I would argue that, and I think we probably all, everyone on this panel would agree that digital inequality is growing and risks becoming one of the most important factors contributing to global economic inequality over the next 25 years. Um, and just, just as they are doing for other social uh, and economic causes such as climate change, Wall Street can play a powerful role in helping close the global broadband gap. Um, and there's no question that uh, universal affordable broadband access can fit into the ESG framework under the S in ESG, certainly social. Um, and there are some ESG ratings agencies such as MSCI that I mentioned before that do include access to communications in their current ESG rating system. And, and MSCI definitely is much more transparent than some of the other ESG raters that are out there. Uh, but even, even, even what it, MSCI is doing and presumably others, um, these efforts today are really, um, uh, uneven and, and anemic at best. Um, uh, even when accounted for, access to communications is weighted as the least important issue for communications, wireless and telecommunications providers, uh, less than any of the issues that they're held accountable or credited for. Um, and many of the world's largest uh, connectivity providers uh, are not held accountable at all for, uh, for or, or, or rewarded for their efforts to increase access to communications. Um, in addition, major tech companies like Microsoft that I, who I used to work for, um, which now controls some of the largest telecommunications networks in the world are, are neither rewarded or held accountable for their efforts uh, to close the global broadband gap. Um, and that doesn't even account for all the other industries that increasingly rely on connectivity for their success. I mean, think about it. I mean, I would be hard pressed to name any industry that's not reliant on connectivity for its future success. So why wouldn't this be part of um, uh, ESG ratings? Um, so, so in closing, given the importance of unlocking uh, opp uh, opportunities and to social and economic development, um, ESG related investments should reward meaningful and measurable efforts to close the global broadband gap. Uh, that's just one idea. Um, I'm, I'm sure we're gonna talk about a bunch of other things and thank you very much for your time. Great, thanks a lot, uh, Paul, uh, for um, letting, on, letting us know about how uh, ESG investing can be used to help close the global uh, broadband gap. 
Let us now move to the um, uh, third um, uh, panelist, uh, Dr. Elizabeth uh, Belding, uh, who is the professor, uh, who is professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara and who will uh, talk about expanding the focus of digital uh, innovation. Let me give, uh, big, let me give a, a brief uh, a bio of Professor Belding. Uh, so uh, Professor Belding research focus on mobile and wireless networking, including network performance analysis and information and communication technologies for development, ICTD. Her ICTD projects have included work in Zambia, South Africa, Mongolia, and refugee camps. Most recently, she has been working with Native American communities around the U.S. Elizabeth, the floor is yours. Thank you, Slim. I appreciate it. And thanks for the opportunity to be here. Um, so as Slim said, um, I'd like to talk about how we can expand the focus um, of digital innovation. And I'd like to start um, with just a little bit of statistics. Um, so we've already heard this morning that um, in the 52 years since the Internet has been created, um, we now have access for about half of the world's population, um, which is, you know, fantastic on one hand. Um, and I think a lot of this panel is focused on the other half of the 50% um, or the other 50%. So how do we get access to the remaining 50% of users um, or people who want to be able to use the internet? Um, but I'd like to instead pick up on something um, that Paul was talking about at the beginning, um, which is trying to understand more deeply what a graph like this actually represents for the 50% of the population that does have internet access. Um, and in particular, a, a graph like this, which is from the ITU, is really just an indication of whether or not they have access. And Paul indicated that um, you know, this data might represent whether or not someone has been able to access the internet in the last 90 days. Um, and clearly, um, if you're accessing the internet every 90 days, that's very different than having the internet at home or in your pocket, as I like to call it, pocket access um, with your mobile phone. So I think it's really important to dive deeper into a graph like this and not just take it at surface value and say, okay, so we know 50% of the population doesn't have access and we need to address that. But what about the 50% that does have access and should we just assume that everything is just fine there? Um, and so, you know, there's lots of ways that we can try to quantify what an internet user is. Um, we've already heard that we can talk about it in terms of frequency of access. Um, and, you know, obviously if you're accessing the internet only once every 90 days, um, your model of how you use the internet is gonna be very different than if you have um, that home or access in your pocket. Um, so this is um, more data from the ITU that looks at um, where people access the internet and in particular if they have internet availability at home. And so what we see is that the vast majority of people in the developed world are able to access the internet at home, um, whereas in the developing and least developed countries, um, they don't. Um, they don't have that home internet access. So um, if they're lucky, they might have access at school or at work but much more likely is that they're accessing the internet at an internet cafe um, where they might be paying per byte or per minute. Um, they might be accessing it at a library. Um, and you know, we saw in the COVID pandemic, um, something that had been happening for years, even here in the US, which is that um, people without home internet access were showing up in McDonald's parking lots and hotels in order to access free Wi-Fi so that they could do their schoolwork. Um, and work and stay connected. Um, and so, you know, this, this really um, very obviously changes the model of usage where when you have that home access or that pocket access, you have a very casual relationship with the internet where you might access it tens or even hundreds of times per day to look something up very quickly or check your email. Um, whereas if you're having to travel for internet access, you're probably pre-planning what you're gonna do. You're time limited. There might be someone over your shoulder waiting for their access to your terminal. Um, you might be, again, paying per minute or per byte. Some people have been known to pre-type emails in order to save um, on the cost of internet access. Um, and yet, you know, in, in the graph that we first saw, 
these individuals would still be considered internet users. Um, so obviously there's a huge discrepancy there. We can also look at internet access by the speed of access. Um, and another great um, data point Paul mentioned was that some people are gonna be on 6G while others are still on 2G. Um, and that's, that's very true. Um, we see huge discrepancies in access both at the country level as well as within countries, people have um, very different levels um, of data speeds available. And you know, this is really important because we're all accessing the same internet, right? We're all trying to access the same web pages. And it's not just a matter of slowing things down if you have a slower connection, but some of that content is even going to become inaccessible because what we've seen over the last, well, basically since the internet has, has been born is that web page size and complexity has continued to grow um, year over year. And so this is just looking at the change in size over the last decade and the types of content um, that appear in a web page. And basically what it shows is that web pages, um, as we know, are getting much, much bigger. They have embedded images, embedded videos, embedded fonts. Um, and so if you're using an internet access technology from a decade or two ago, but you're trying to access today's internet content, um, you have a really big problem um, where it's gonna take an inordinate amount of time um, just to get a single page. Um, and so these two graphs dive a little bit deeper um, into the, the prior graph. The graph on the top left um, is an indication of the growth of web page size over um, full 10 years. Um, and so it shows that the average web page size is about um, two megabytes now. And in the bottom right, we can see the growth of images. Um, and of course, you know, there's, there's videos and other things. And so if, again, if you're paying um, for the time you're using the internet or the byte count, um, this really diminishes the usability of the internet. And so even again, in that initial graph, even though you're being counted as an internet user, um, much of the internet might be pretty inaccessible to you if you're behind one of those really slow connections um, and if you don't have that home access. Lastly, um, I just wanna show a graph of where the data lives. So this is um, a graph of um, data centers around the world and the num rough numbers of data centers. Um, and so again, unsurprisingly, it shows that the data centers are located in the places where access tends to be much better and internet connectivity is better. And so, you know, it's a, it's a double or triple impediment to people where now, you know, if you're in the middle of Africa or in the Far East, um, not only do you have a slower connection and it's harder to get the internet access in the first place, but your data probably has to physically travel a much greater distance. Um, which of course increases propagation delay. And so it takes longer to get that web page. Um, web pages are also, um, because they have so many embedded objects these days, they can be hosted on many, many different servers around the world. Um, and so all of that adds to the complexity of trying to get that data um, to the individual. Um, so again, it, it creates this very difficult experience, even though they might be counted in that 50% of the population that does have internet access. Um, so at this point, I'd like to turn to a concept called the diffusion of innovation. Um, this was developed by Everett Rogers um, some decades ago, and it applies really well um, to technology where you have time on the X axis and you know, as a new technology is developed, we see it taken up gradually at first and then the majority comes in and adopts it and at the end are the laggards. Um, and so the yellowish line shows that, you know, if you wait long enough, then everybody should have access to the technology. Um, and, you know, I, when I talk about Internet inequality and digital inequality, um, people often will ask me, you know, well, why don't we just wait? Um, why don't we wait five years or so um, and then everything will be fine? Um, and the answer is that, you know, while I've been working in this space a lot longer than five years and the problem's gotten worse, not better. Um, but really what's happening is that we have um, development for the developed world um, down here and then the developing world is up at the top. And while we can wait um, for technology to trickle down, 
um, the target is moving, right? Because we're the vast majority of computer scientists and others who develop technology are developing that technology for those who already have good access um, and have, you know, high internet speeds. Um, and so it's a moving target. And so you end up with people in the developing world, again, accessing today's internet with technologies from a decade or more ago. Um, and so it simply doesn't work. And so this is never going to fix itself um, unless we also turn our attention to developing technologies for those who don't already have them or who have substandard technologies. Um, and this is gonna require new innovations because the constraints um, of these areas and, and these populations are very different um, than what we see in the developed world. So the population densities might be different if it's a rural area, the economic incentives are gonna be different um, because of poverty, the needs are different, the geographies, the terrains might be very different. And so what we see time and time again is that the technology that's created for those in the developed world that have a certain set of circumstances is not necessarily appropriate um, for the developing world. And so we simply can't just wait for it to trickle down. Um, and so I argue that, you know, if we can have these dual foci where we're also trying to invest in new technologies that are appropriate for the developing world, then we can really shrink this adoption curve um, and get people caught up um, and on a level playing field. So I just wanna end um, with one slide on the types of work we're doing in my research group at UC Santa Barbara. Um, our focus is on challenge context, which includes those in developing regions. It also includes um, marginalized communities or otherwise disadvantaged communities in the US. Um, and it also includes communities that might have infrastructure that becomes unavailable, for instance, due to a natural disaster when a hurricane or, or earthquake wipes out what is there. Um, so we have a, a focus on alternative internet access technologies, all of which are wireless. Um, we've done work in TV white space, um, looking at that as a technology for um, bringing more communities online. We have a project starting on CBRS We've looked at how LoRa, which is a low bit rate, um, but very long distance communication mechanism can be used to partially bridge the gap um, for, to communities. And we've also looked um, at the use of drones um, for post-disaster scenarios um, that could then be flied in, flown in to uh, bridge the connectivity gap um, that's created when infrastructure is wiped out. And all of this work um, is, is motivated and informed by the second focus of our work, which is network measurement and analysis. So trying to understand where internet access exists and what the quality of that internet access is. Um, so, you know, like the theme of the talk, not just saying yes or no, is there connectivity, but is it actually really usable by the people who are there that need to use it? Um, can they do online learning, telemedicine and so forth? Um, we look at how distinct communities use the internet Sometimes there's, there's interesting usage patterns um, in communities that um, can motivate new architectures or new technological designs that are more appropriate for the types of scenarios um, in which they wanna use the internet. Um, we look at how well their internet access links do meet their needs. Um, and again, we use all of this to drive um, our innovations around novel network architectures and technologies. Um, so if you'd like to learn more about what we're doing, um, this is my webpage. Uh, my research group is the Mobility Management and Networking Lab at UCSB. And then Pueblo Connect is um, our most recent project, NSF funded, um, on getting um, technologies for some of the Native American Pueblos and reservations um, to get them online. Um, so thank you for the time, and I look forward to your questions. Thanks a lot, uh, Elizabeth. Uh, very interesting remarks. I like in particular this connection between uh, connecting the unconnected and also establishing connectivity in the case of a post-disaster uh, situation, because indeed there are some interesting kind of uh, parallel that can be made uh, between these two scenarios. Uh, so let, let, before moving to the Q&A part uh, and the debate part of our panel, uh, let me give the floor to uh, 
our uh, fourth speaker, uh, Aida Jalo, who is uh, the senior li liaison officer of the ITU to the United Nations. Uh, she's based in New York City in the USA. Uh, she'll be talking uh, about an overview of connectivity in the least developing countries and small island developing states. Uh, let me give a, a brief bio of uh, Aida. Aida is a lawyer by profession with a master degree with merit in law from the University of London. Uh, she started her career as a regulator in the Gambia, her native country, uh, for four years. And then um, she had many positions and more recently, uh, as I mentioned, she's now the ITU Senior Liaison Officer to United Nations in charge of the least developing countries and small island countries. Aida, the floor is yours. Aida, uh, I think you are muted. Sorry about that. Yes, now we hear you. Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'm glad to be here. Uh, I'm glad that my presentation will be following closely that of Elizabeth, because uh, she did talk about um, some of the challenges as did Paul on, on connecting the unconnected. But I think sometimes uh, these discussions are a bit far removed when we don't actually talk about the communities and the, and, and the countries that are actually facing um, some of the challenges of not being connected to the internet. As we know, the COVID uh, pandemic has impacted all the countries, but we, we, you can imagine that the impact would be greater felt in countries that have weaker economies, underdeveloped infrastructures, dependencies on developed economies, and um, um, ICT, as we have seen, have proved to be both resilient to the impact of COVID-19 and an important tool that we are all using uh, to stay connected and for digital transformation. I'm trying to change my slide uh, slim and it's not working. Uh, Ida? Yes, I'm, I'm trying to change my slides. It's not moving. Uh, uh, yeah, I think, uh, yes, uh, I'm, I'm not sure uh, what's the issue for, I mean, it's, uh, it's been um, one possibility is you, you need to be in the uh, window where, that has the slides being presented. I don't know what you're using. Yes, I'm, I'm there. Okay. Can you see it? Yes, we can yes. see it. Yeah, but okay. we are still on the first slide here. Can you move to the next slide? Yes. Let's see, we're still seeing the first slide. Okay. So okay. Um, when, yeah. when we talk about uh, the development needs, um, what is the status quo? Um, if we zoom in into small island developing states, we see that 30 to 70% of workers are in very vulnerable employment. We see 14% that have absolutely no access to electricity. And we see 60% that do not use the internet. And there's a 14% from GDP lost on every uh, natural disaster. So where and, and, and what are the LDCs? The least developed countries, um, they predominantly um, countries that are in Africa and some small island states. And the characteristics they have in common are that they have low saving rates, they have poor and vulnerable institutions and infrastructures, they're highly dependent on international aid and trade. So you can imagine in a period of COVID when every country is trying to deal with its own internal problems, there won't be much of that going around. They also have low literacy rates and they have inadequate technology and capital. Um, so 49 of these least developed countries, um, 33 of them are in Africa. Kenya in Asia, you have one in the Caribbean and um, five in the Pacific. Some of the small island states, 
Now, what, what constitutes connectivity in the LDCs? Of course, we have the international backbones, the international connectivity. We have a backbone made from microwave and fiber backbones. Then we have the last mile connectivity. And I, I think I'll talk about that uh, a little further. So when we come to international connectivity, especially for sub-Saharan Africa, uh, what we find, which is very interesting, is that among the countries, um, most of the countries that have the greatest impact in terms of um, not being connected to the internet are also land. They're not just um, least developed countries, but they are also LLDCs, which is landlocked least developed countries. Um, looking at the terrestrial connectivity using the fiber backbone, uh, the main form of broadband access in, in Africa is still wireless. So still our mobile phones are very important to us. And it's interesting that in this discussion, we're talking about 6G, uses of 6G. And I like what some of the speakers previous to me said about the disparity, because you find that in a um, lot of these countries, people are still using 2G. Sorry. Now, um, this is just the top 25 countries in Africa by internet users. And you see that the first country on that list is Nigeria, mainly also because Nigeria is the most populous uh, um, country on the continent with the biggest population. And then it goes down to Egypt, Kenya, with uh, Burkina Faso being right down there. Um, when we talk about international bandwidth usage, uh, looking at the um, usage, bandwidth usage in the rest of the world, and looking at what LDCs are using, I think it uh, gives a very clear picture of the challenges that we have in, in connectivity. We are so, so far behind what, what the global usage rates are. Um, the mobile network coverage in, in Africa also has uh, a, a big divide between urban and rural. Um, the divide is highest with 4G infrastructure. And incidentally, we're now talking about 6G, but now we're seeing where even in 4G, you see a digital divide where 75% of the 4G coverage is in urban areas with only 22% in the rural areas. 23 of the population have absolutely no access to broadband. Uh, mobile subscriptions, uh, we've also noticed a decline of mobile subscriptions in the LDCs and developing countries, but we feel that further research is needed to establish whether this is due to the economic effects of COVID-19 or are there other economic factors at, at, at play here. So um, with uh, more data gathering and future reports, we'll be able to talk to that, to that point. Um, we at the ITU, um, have a lot of initiatives, and I think I'll take the, um, this opportunity to talk about our Connect to Recover. Uh, and uh, Connect to Recover is an initiative for the reinforcement of digital infrastructure and ecosystems of beneficiary countries. It is expected that digital technologies such, such as teleworking, e-commerce, remote learning, and telemedicine would support the COVID recovery efforts. Um, it also seeks to galvanize action for affordable and reliable connectivity as part of the COVID-19 recovery strategies. And we have also done a lot of work, especially for those uh, landlocked countries that I mentioned earlier on the, uh, a project called the HIPSA project that was a joint project between the ITU funded by the European Union, where uh, there were guidelines developed on what these landlocked countries need to do in order to be able to best utilize the, the opportunity for access that they have uh, from their neighboring countries that are, that are on, the, on the coastal lines of, of, of Africa. I think I'll, I want to stop there for now, and I will um, be here to entertain any questions that you may have in the Q&A. Over to you, Steve. Thanks a lot, Aida, for this nice overview. I think uh, 
many of us maybe are, are not aware of, of uh, this uh, uh, this issue and this kind of uh, specificity or the, the specific problem that our uh, uh, I mean that the landlocked countries are uh, are suffering from. So that, I think that was a very interesting uh, overview. Uh, Vint, I think you 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 already want to make a remark here. I see that you're raising your hand. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, these are all fantastic data to have. Uh, Ida and uh, Milo and Elizabeth, uh, we really appreciate having some uh, useful uh, data. I just wanted to mention one interesting uh, response at Google uh, to the infrastructure question. Uh, and in Uganda, uh, we um, worked together with some other partners to build a municipal uh, optical fiber network, which was made available on a wholesale basis to uh, a number of retailers who competed with each other for uh, for uh, business from the uh, consumers uh, in the capital city. And I think we also uh, pursued a similar arrangement uh, in Ghana, uh, in Accra. But the idea here was to uh, introduce a wholesale layer uh, and to make an investment in that so as to facilitate competitive uh, operation at the retail level. You can easily imagine a government deciding to do something like that as well, to, to deliberately make an investment uh, in infrastructure or alternatively to deliberately provide uh, subsidies in order to uh, deal with the economic disparity uh, and affordability of, uh, of Internet service. Uh, I have a bunch of other comments, but uh, I'll hold them for now uh, and we'll see how the uh, conversation uh, emerges. Any extra uh, uh, remarks before we move to some of the questions that have been raised by, from the audience? Okay. Let's see. I, I have, yes, I have to uh, unmute and I also have to go back and look at uh, some of the questions. Here's one. It says, why is it do you think that the internet evolves continuously at breakneck speed, but in the wireless world still insists on Gs? I actually don't fully understand the question because it felt like the G initiatives have also uh, evolved pretty quickly from 2G to 3G to 4G to 5G to 6G. Um, but like uh, the famous author has said, uh, the future is here, but it's not uniformly distributed. Uh, and that's certainly true for the various wireless uh, access methods, on top of which we're seeing other uh, alternative methods like the LEO satellites going uh, full blast as well. And for Ida, a question for her, I have been very surprised to see how much undersea cable development has been going on in the past decade. Far more undersea cable being built than I had expected would be. Uh, part of it, I think, is economics. Some companies like Google have reached the point where we were building uh, fiber on our own as opposed to uh, partnering with others uh, because it's become affordable. Uh, so uh, a number of nation, uh, island nations uh, are connected by fiber that I had not anticipated would be. Uh, and I think that's increasing. Vanuatu is a good example where they obtained uh, support from the World Bank uh, to make a high-speed uh, fiber connection to the capital city. Uh, so, um, Ida, maybe you can speak a little bit to the various alternative methods for connectivity, including the, the LEO uh, potential. Uh, which strikes me as being pretty exciting, given that it theoretically has 100% coverage. No, absolutely, absolutely. When you're you're quite right um, on the different modes of connectivity, but we are seeing a very um, sort of high adoption of fiber because it has uh, translated into um, lower cost of connectivity. But even, even where um, in the countries that are on the coast in Africa, in countries such as Vanuatu, the islands that have actually landed a cable, you still see a very decided uh, digital divide. So we are learning um, all over that it's not just uh, the availability of the infrastructure for access that, that determines who's connected to the internet. But you also find that there are other issues as, at, at play, such as digital skills, the lack of digital skills, not knowing what to do with it and how to, when you're connected, what exactly you put, um, uh, what use you put that connection to. And also we're seeing decidedly divide, such as the divide between the numbers of um, um, male that are using the internet as opposed to, to women and why that is. 
So um, that is, the divides are becoming more compounded. Not not we we used to talk about the urban rural divide. Now we're talking about the digital divide in terms of gender. We're talking about digital divide even in terms of digital skills capability. Over Brilliant. to you, Slim. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, there is another qu interesting question in the chat that uh, all of us are seeing, and I think it's it, it, it's a uh, it, it's it's a really good question. In the sense that uh, this is the kind of question I actually, in a way, posed in my uh, in my opening uh, remark. So uh, I read the question. I think part of the problem is that as an industry, we tend to focus on neat new technologies, and uh, uh, the, the the person who's asking the question is giving as an example millimeter wave. Uh, so, but uh, if we want to connect everyone, don't we need to get back to basics like more efficient coverage, more affor affordable handset? I'm not sure 6G will deliver that. So this is uh, again the always kind of uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, problem that researchers tend to go for this uh, pushing the envelope type of records uh, in terms of uh, higher speed, lower latency, but they tend to forget to go back to basics and extend coverage and connect more people. Anyone wants to kind of uh, answer this question? Okay, let's start with Elizabeth then Paul. Um, yeah, I'd just like to say that I don't think those are mutually exclusive. Um, so, you know, like I had in, in that last graph, I think we can do very interesting innovations that are pushing the envelope um, for the those who don't already have connectivity. And, you know, some of the technologies I mentioned on the last slide are examples of that. So. TV white spaces, CBRS, um, parts of 6G, you know, it's not clear what that's gonna be yet for yet. Um, you're right, millimeter wave is, is not a good technology for a lot of um, the people who still need to be connected. Um, but I, I think there's a lot of good things we can do. There's interesting business models. Um, and as a researcher, and I, I think I personally find it a really interesting intellectual problem about how can we design these new technologies um, for these populations. Um, I think it's just that, you know, with our, our current models um, of recouping costs and so forth, um, a lot of the innovation has been for those who already have the high technologies, but, you know, intellectually, I think it's it's a much harder and more interesting problem um, and certainly has can have much bigger impacts if we're focusing um, on the other half of the population. Thanks, Elizabeth. Paul? Um, yeah, I would, I would actually, uh, Slim, I would actually expand it to beyond just uh, researchers, and I would actually expand it to industry uh, as well, I think, in, the, in specifically in sort of the mainstream uh, standardization of technology, whether that's in 3GPP or, or in IEEE, um, there definitely is a focus on you know, it all begins with use cases and the use cases that that industry has tended to focus on with next generation technologies have been use cases that basically make internet connectivity better for people who already have it. Um, so what we've seen with next generation of, 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 of Wi-Fi standardization, we've seen the same thing with 3GPP, like with millimeter wave, um, massive amounts of throughput, low, super low latencies, um, because of the physics of the spectrum that, that they're operating in shorter, shorter distances. So environments with a lot of fiber connectivity, getting closer to the customer and, and huge amounts of throughput and very little thought or really afterthought to other kinds of use cases, um, you know, that, that are more applicable to those in the world who currently have connectivity. Um, so it, what ends up happening is these kinds of issues get dealt with as, as an afterthought or outside the mainstream standardization process, like like you know, like some of the activities Elizabeth's involved in and many others. And I, I guess the I I think that we need to figure out a way to change that. I don't know whether it happens in the mainstream standardization process or some sort of alternative way of of creating uh, technology at a at a larger scale. Um, uh, that actually can 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 uh, address address these issues because I think if we just wait for the mainstream, the usual way of doing things is not going to solve these problems. Yeah, 
But I, I feel that uh, I'm not sure if uh, others agree with me that uh, in this cycle of uh, the next G, uh, we are talking much more about the chill divide than it was the case, I, I think, 10 years ago. So I believe there is more, uh, I mean, the, the problem is becoming a more uh, urgent problem, a problem that people feel that uh, the problem eventually has to be solved. So I hope that now that we are, uh, that we are at the early cycle of uh, uh, 6G development as 5G uh, is basically evolving itself, that this uh, issue of connect and connected is becoming is going to become a big part of uh, the development of the next generation of uh, wireless communication systems. And I, I guess the evolution of the non-terrestrial networks, as, as we tend to call them uh, as part of the 3GPP standard, can help actually uh, see this convergence between satellite and mobile communication that can eventually help uh, connect uh, and connect it. Uh, that, that is my perspective. I'm not sure if uh, anyone wants to add uh, to this point. Uh, Milo, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think um, part of this is the standards and the tech are building blocks and people assemble them to build different kinds of solutions. One of the challenges is if you're a large operator and your main business is in the large urban areas or the, 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 the better off parts of the community, the incremental revenue you get from going after these other less uh, populous or, or low density areas can be very small. And so you just don't have the motivation to go after that. That's part of the logic behind CBRS and other mechanisms for spectrum sharing that puts spectrum into the hands of people who may be non-traditional actors, uh, and they can use different kinds of technology to leverage that spectrum to deliver service. So today, you know, if you build a network that's optimized for mobile uh, data, it's not nearly as good for fixed. But if you took that spectrum and you built equipment that was sort of optimized for fixed wireless, you know. Uh, you can do amazing things. And uh, in the US, we have a lot of WISP using unlicensed spectrum, doing very innovative things. Uh, I think if they had access to spectrum that particularly in areas where traditional carriers are not deploying, they could use 5G and 6G technology to, in different ways to reach those communities. So part of the problem is uh, in wireless, spectrum is the sort of raw resource. And if you only give it to people who have very limited business models, you're going to get limited service options as a result. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot, Milo. Any extra remark on this point? I guess so, one thing. I, one thing I would say is just to, just to add is um, I think fixed broadband and fixed wireless broadband is 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 really where all the runway is. Um, so, and, and I think we're, I think we're, and I think 5G has been, you know, obviously there's been huge technological innovation and benefit that's, that has come from it. But I think that it's it's not going to be um, all that the marketers want us to believe it will be. Um, and I think what what industry is realizing is that even in a place like the U.S., 42 million people don't have uh, broadband available to them if, if, if they want to buy it. And, and then you look at a place like Africa or other emerging markets where the percentages are, are, of the population without access to fixed broadband is, is, is huge. And if you look, and then if you look at where growth is actually occurring in the industry, it's not happening in the mobile industry anymore. You know, the mo mobile industry gets to a point of maturity where all they're doing is fighting over the same pie, market pie, and just grabbing market share from each other. Where's the, where's the future revenue growth going to be for those companies? It's going to be in fixed broadband connectivity. So I think what we're seeing is a realization in industry and a, a mainstream of a lot of the things that I, wireless ISPs have been doing for 20 years, which is basically using all kinds of wireless, you know, terrestrial and other kinds of wireless technologies to bring broadband to people. And, and I think there's a huge opportunity there in the next decade. I think 6G can definitely take advantage of that. Yeah, go ahead, Elizabeth. Actually, I see Ida has her hand up. I'll follow her. Okay, go ahead, Ida. Thank you. Um, I, I was just going to jump in in that question of uh, broadband access and um, the what Paul said about the mobile operators all con concentrating on the same pie. That has been to a large extent true 
um, for example, in the Africa continent, but we've also found um, that universal access funds were set up where um, um, there were contributions that were being made to the fund. And these funds were supposed to now uh, be used to roll out infrastructure to rural areas and to other parts of the country that were not enjoying as much connectivity as the urban areas. But what we have found in a whole lot of the countries in Africa and elsewhere is that there has been millions and millions of dollars sitting in those universal service funds that ended, at, ended up not being used in the sector, but they were just sitting there, nobody was using them. So in some countries, you actually had the government coming to the regulator and saying, look, you're sitting on this pile of money and you're not using it anyway, so why don't I use it? for infrastructure like roads and, and so that there's a there's a lot more to the conversation, especially in developing countries and in the small island states. Over to you, Sue. Good. Yes, Elizabeth. Yeah, I'll just add briefly that you know you asked, you said that 6G seems like a great opportunity to now um, address a lot of these connectivity issues. And I would just say I, I don't think that it's going to happen organically. I, you know, I, I think it needs events like these and people within these organizations really pushing for new business models and new new use cases um, for why we need to do this connectivity um, because the Good Samaritan approach hasn't necessarily worked. Um, and you know, when five G was coming out. It was the same thing, right? We were talking about, oh, this this is it. This is how we're going to get rural communities online. And now what we're seeing is that it looks like it's going to make the gap even worse. And so, I, you know, I, I wouldn't want to get complacent and just say, okay, well, 6G will just evolve and it'll fix it. Um, it's really going to take a lot of advocacy um, and innovative thinking about business models and use cases and economic incentives in order to really um, make that change for this new generation of technology. Okay, thanks. Uh, actually, Vint is making some interesting remark here, uh, saying that some people are reporting a trend towards increased fraction of population moving to cities, uh, and uh, how might that affect connectivity? So, Vint, are you saying that basically the problems will disappear because we are not to have any more people living, living in rural areas? Well, I don't want to argue that it, the problem will just go away automatically, but I do think if that is a trend uh, that uh, we may see the fraction of population that's not connected um, shrinking on the presumption that they end up in a city that has uh, urban uh, available urban connectivity. I'm not suggesting that we should therefore just ignore the problem. Uh, I'm just wondering whether that trend is significant. As global warming uh, happens, we may see other uh, effects about uh, migration away from the coast, yeah. for example, or away from rivers and things of that kind. Uh, I did want to bring up uh, one phenomenon that we watched happen in Europe and in Latin America. In the earlier days of the internet, uh, many of the countries had internet services that were not connected to other countries in the region they went up to, for example, Latin America, everybody went up to the NAMP of the Americas in, in uh, Miami. And so going from, you know, say Chile to Argentina was, you know, go up to the US and come back down again. In the early days, uh, that was true in uh, Europe where we had two different, you know, educational networks that were connected to the national research backbones. And to go uh, from one to the other, they went to the US the East Coast and then, you know, ping pong back across the Atlantic. The, implement, uh, the in investment in internet exchange um, points uh, made a big difference because it confined the traffic uh, to the uh, European continent or to uh, in LATAM as well. So one thing we might ask ourselves is whether investment in IXP facilities in, for example, Africa would, uh, would help to confine the traffic to the continent, which would improve a number of, of parameters, including latency. Of course, this requires agreement among the various parties providing service to interconnect at the internet exchange points, or, or at some point perhaps having direct peering arrangements because the bandwidth requirement is high enough to justify the cost. Yeah, Vin, can I uh, just say um, these days, you know, with CDNs driving the bulk of consumer traffic and cloud uh, uh, companies being the source of the rest of it, uh, it's not so much people talking to each other that 
in the old days drove sort of interconnects. It's really interconnection to content sources, which are more concentrated these days than ever before. So thinking about hubs in Africa and in other uh, landlocked areas where you would have CDNs all interconnected uh, and present, uh, as well as uh, sort of cloud edge uh, compute, uh, that could be the source of really reducing the amount of inner exchange traffic sort of required. Uh, it's a very different internet than it, than it was even 10 years ago from a traffic perspective. Slim, just to reinforce that, uh, one thing that I'm seeing, of course, what Milo was saying, which is that we built this gigantic network to go out and touch the rest of the internet and then have uh, our consumers use our uh, uh, cloud-based services uh, within a hop, uh, one hop of, uh, of their origin network. Uh, landing on our, what we call B2 network. Uh, and so a number of others uh, are doing the same kind of thing, Facebook, for example, um, Amazon. So you're seeing a massive uh, construction of network connectivity to uh, the immediate ISPs that connect customers into the system. Uh, and that, uh, that too reduces uh, latency and increases access to the CDM facilities. Okay, very good. Ida, you want to add to this? No, you are muted, Ida. Just very quickly, I, I just wanted to say I'm glad that um, somebody brought up the internet exchange points, which is uh, one um, policy that a lot of African countries are following. But even in the countries that have actually established internet access, um, access points, they're seeing that uh, development of local content is also key. Because, you know, without the development of local content, the the traffic is more or less what, what it used to be before, before the internet, internet exchange point, because everything that you want to get on the internet, you're ha having to come all the way to Google to, to ask it and search for it and whatever, and then it comes back to your country. So um, yes, internet exchange points, but in tandem, we, we at least for the developing countries that have trying to play catch up, we also need to look very seriously to the development of local content. And of course, the development of the digital skills, which is still a big challenge. Over to you, Steve. I was muted, sorry, I was muted. So actually one of the panelists mentioned actually also just go, go, going back to the initial remark made by uh, by um, Vin that uh, obviously if we improve rural connectivity, we can uh, initiate a counter urbanization process and kind of go against that trend where people may tend to move to rural areas while kind of keeping a good quality of life because connectivity will be good even in these remote areas. So that's another argument that uh, we can put forward. Uh, you know, we, we have uh, maybe 15 or so more minutes to go. Uh, let me ask uh, one question that is uh, important, and some of you touch upon this issue uh, as part of your presentation and this discussion, which is the notion of spectrum sharing techniques with unlicensed or shared spectrum uh, networks. Uh, we talked about TV white space or CBRS, not in detail. Uh, can you, can some of you tell us a little bit about your experience with TV white space CBRS in the US? How do you think this is kind of making uh, uh, the network uh, more affordable in rural areas? and how this experience can maybe expand beyond the U.S. and even beyond other bands within the U.S. Who would like to kind of maybe address this question of uh, spectrum sharing, CBRS, TV white space? Yeah, I can talk a little bit about CBRS. Um, CBRS, or Citizens Broadband Radio Service, uh, is a um, system approved in the United States sharing military radar spectrum. So in, in the US, the go federal government controls a number of large swaths of spectrum. Uh, one of them is used by uh, from 3.55 to 3.7 gigahertz. Uh, and this uh, spectrum is primarily used by the air traffic control radar on aircraft carriers of which there are not that many. Uh, and so we worked uh, at Google uh, with um, uh, partners in the carriers and in the um, uh, uh, WISP community 
uh, to work with the federal government to find a way to share that spectrum by deploying a network of sensors that can detect these radars. And when those radars go active, turn off or move users so that they yeah. don't interfere with them. Um, spectrum sharing has always been sort of possible through administrative processes. But with CBRS, our goal was to replace administrative people, uh, poobahs, with uh, code uh, and automate that process. Uh, and in the US, there's two kinds of CBRS spectrum, general availability, where you have no guarantee of protection from interference and protected area access, PALs, which are auctioned uh, in sort of the normal way. But CBRS, there's always a chunk of spectrum available for sort of uh, general access. It's not unlicensed in that you have to go connect to a spectrum access system to give you authority uh, to use spectrum in a particular area. Uh, uh, and it uh, manages the interference with these other users. Uh, there's no reason why that technology couldn't be used to actually share between civil users. So for example, if I've got uh, areas where a MNO has built out um, and areas where they haven't, you could use a similar kind of system to grant access to that spectrum. Um, so it enforces this sort of priority access to spectrum. You know, it's, it's not the 80s anymore. We can use... Uh, uh, code now and our models of geospatial data and propagation to actually share spectrum in many more efficient ways. And that has in the US allowed WISPs, these wireless internet service providers to go out and uh, build networks in this band um, and deliver service in rural areas and rural communities using technology is more optimized for fixed than mobile. And it's also allowed building owners to build indoor networks because one of the things we see in the US is more than half of cellular data comes out of indoor locations. So building all this stuff outside doesn't actually help you uh, where, the bulk of, uh, where the bulk of cellular data comes from. So there's a whole set of interesting things by enabling um, non-traditional actors, people who own buildings, people who own facilities, people in rural areas to use spectrum and build broadband solutions optimized for their particular use model. And we think this is a great um, experience in the US that other countries could benefit from and not allocating things in the, in the way we used to allocate them in the, in the 90s. And do you see the CBRS paradigm being used in other parts of the bands, uh, I don't know, like around 60 hertz and beyond? We're looking at uh, right now in the 3.1 to 3.55 bands where you have a lot of military users where that can be usable. And in the US, we have something similar called AFC, which is taking 800 megahertz of spectrum above the Wi-Fi five gigahertz band, making that available for sort of semi-unlicensed use using, uh, again, they call it the AFC, but it's really a, a spectrum access system. Uh, and that those are bands where you point to point microwave users. And so, being able to share point-to-point -point microwave bands for uh, Wi-Fi style access is eminently doable with spectrum management systems that can compute interference and, and give you permission wow. to use it. Sure. Uh, Paul, go ahead, please. Yeah, I can, I can add on to that on, on TV white spaces and I suspect Elizabeth may have some comments there as well. Um, but just first, I, I would say that just overall, um, the one way to look at this is these are building block <coughs> spectrum bands and they're complementary and they're good for different things. And so, you know, what we see, you know, you know, going from TD white spaces, which is, you know, below one gigahertz all the way up to millimeter wave, different frequency bands with different propagation characteristics. And and uh, you know different so different ranges and also just different amounts of spectrum. More spectrum, as Michael said earlier, available in the higher bands, less in the in the lower bands. So when it comes to something like um, TV white spaces, you know, I think we all just, we just have to think of these things as all being complementary to one another. So I, ISPs definitely are are deploying CBRS um, technology at a high rate right now, um, which is great. Um, but what they're going to find is is the laws of physics are going to get in the way of them being able to reach certain customers uh, once again. And um, so it's something like TD white space 
is, you know, you know, can and will be a nice complement to what they're doing in other bands to essentially extend the range of of um, of, of their connections, you know, from the same base station. So adding an extra kilometer or two of, of, of radius around around the tower to reach more customers and, and through foliage. Um, and um, what surprised me actually since I left Microsoft is, is how many companies actually are still looking at TD White Spaces, including companies I'd, I'd never heard of when, when I was there. So so this is definitely something that's still happening and um, and it's still a, a opportunity alongside all the other great things that are happening in terrestrial as well as space-based communications. Um, and, and a lot more regulators are starting to put um, uh, regulations in place that are allowing you know more dynamic access to spectrum. Very good. Any other comment on spectrum sharing and and large spectrum type of uh, uh, technologies? Okay, let, let me ask my final question to wrap up this panel. Okay, Vin, go ahead. Go ahead, Vin. Uh, uh, Slim, I just wanted to respond to uh, to your invitation. Uh, one of the things that uh, at the FCC. Yeah, in the U.S. that was a, uh, a point of uh, continuous debate uh, had to do with uh, the stupid uh, receiver versus the smart receiver. And for, for many years, all of our policies were designed around the idea that the receivers were stupid and the transmitters had to be really smart. They had to confine the spectrum. They had to have waveforms that didn't drift over into their, or, or uh, generate power and outside of their spectral uh, bands. And the fact that we can build really smart receivers, I think, changes a lot of the dynamics uh, of all of this, including the opportunities for sharing, for moving from one uh, part of the spectrum to another, as uh, Milo was suggesting. But, uh, but I did want to uh, ask Milo uh, once again to emphasize his point, which is that wireless is all wonderful for that you know, last hop of access. But if we don't tie everything together with an optical fiber network, you don't have what you want, which is a fully connected system. You know, I would just say, again, it's a factor of where are people talking? People don't talk to each other locally. They all talk to either a CDN or a cloud-based server somewhere. And so uh, the backhaul, these networks are not like phone systems uh, the, for voice. Uh, you're, not, you're not communicating locally. And so that backhaul piece, which could be done with microwave, but typically not at the speeds required, are important. And one thing that I, I, we found um, uh, that could be really useful is when you think about building power infrastructure, distribution of electrical power, putting fiber on the same routes. Um, if you're going to have high tension lines or power electric distribution, uh, why build two completely separate infrastructures to deliver two services when you want physical infrastructure can do both. So stringing fiber optic core ground wires on the top of high tension lines or uh, distribution along media, medium voltage facilities, there's great opportunity if you're building a, a canal, if you're building power, if you're building gas pipelines, put fiber in at the same time and make that fiber available because you could use 100, you know, 288 strand cables uh, and make tons of fiber accessible on those on those routes. Uh, never pay for the same, same ground twice, I think uh, Patton said, but I think it's useful, useful in this context as well. Very good. Thanks a lot, Milo. Uh, Elizabeth, yes? Yeah, I'd just like to respond to something Milo said um, about that we're not accessing content that's local, we're accessing content that's far away. Um, so, and, you know, in some cases that has to be true. For instance, if we're grabbing a video to watch um, off Netflix or whatever. Um, but in other cases, that's just an artifact of how we've created an internet for the developed world, right? We've created this internet with an expectation of the fact that people have fast access and they have it in their home and so forth. Um, one of the studies that we've done um, in a Native American community and I believe that the results would hold to many other communities is that there's a heavy predominance of interest in locally generated content, right? Like a lot of my friends are local and on my Facebook feed and so forth, I see their pictures and so forth. And it's true that that content is stored very far away, but it didn't have to be. 
You know, it could have been stored within the community and there's no reason that it has to come down over the satellite link or whatever multiple times. Um, it's, it's really just kind of that perfect example of how we created this internet um, with a certain set of assumptions that aren't true for the people who ended up not being connected because they don't live in those circumstances. Um, so I just wanted to take the opportunity to point that out because um, it's kind of the perfect example of what I'm talking about. That's a good point. Well taken. So I, I guess we have just a few minutes. There is probably not enough time to, 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 to take some extra question. What, what I would suggest is maybe uh, if you want, each one of you can have a kind of a concluding statement and that will allow us to wrap up this panel. You, you know, we will have over the coming two days uh, uh, interesting talks about uh, emerging technologies that are promising to, you know, bridge this digital divide. We are talking about Leo satellite, next generation, very high throughput satellites, HAPS, uh, free space optics. So, you know, uh, you may want to comment on that or any other uh, uh, kind of final remark that you'd like to make before we conclude this panel. Vint, you want to start? Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, two things. First of all, Elizabeth's point's well taken. And I would say that the CDNs actually have understood exactly the point that you needed to have local access to content uh, in order to reduce latency uh, and to avoid having to transport a lot of the same thing over and over again through the backbone networks. But uh, it's often so, not local enough is the problem. Yeah. Well, I mean, so but I'm gonna, let me arm wrestle a little bit about that because the uh, typically it's either the central office or the uh, head end of a fiber net or a cable network uh, where you put the CDNs or you put them into data centers, which I agree tend to be very much more dispersed and distant. But the CDNs are deliberately there in order to localize the content at the place where there is an access network. So uh, <clears throat> maybe one of the arguments is that uh, if you want to promulgate, if you want to uh, propagate content uh, to the rural parts of the country, then you better build an access network that can also house the CDN capability. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I don't think we're totally in disagreement here. No, uh, that's exactly, that's exactly. Exact, you know, get the data closer, uh, regardless of the nature of the content, whether it was locally generated or not. Uh, on the uh, free space optics, I just wanted to mention that, uh, that Google has been experimenting, uh, our X organization, uh, has been experimenting with free space lasers that are capable of, of uh, serving 10 to 20 gigabits a second over one to 10 kilometers. And we're using that as an alternative to uh, either point-to-point -point radio or uh, you know fiber links in order to build middle mile. And the costs are interesting because it's like $50,000 for a pair of lasers. Uh, and that's exciting uh, because it drives a lot of cost out. Of course, it doesn't work very well if it's raining like crazy. Uh, or snowing or something else. So, you know, the locations uh, are, are very much, um, you know, the, the success is dependent on local conditions. So I'll stop there and just say there's plenty of room here for us to respond. Yeah, we'll, hear, we'll hear from Baris, uh, who's from Tara, Google kind of uh, spin off uh, on the free space optic uh, kind of development within Google. So uh, th this is one of the talks on, uh, on Thursday. Uh, Milo, any concluding remarks? No, I would just say um, uh, modern technology has enabled us to do amazing things. And so how we assemble it really matters. Policy really matters. You know, uh, we had a recent auction here in the United States for C-band spectrum uh, for 5G use that raised over $90 billion for the U.S. Treasury. But that $90 billion could have been spent on actually deploying networks instead of actually going to the U.S. government. And so I think we need to think about um, if we really are building these networks, which have much deeper footprints, this is not just a few macro cell sites, uh, the economics of building that higher speed infrastructure are going to be very different than building the, your basic oh. sort of connectivity. And so thinking about spectrum uh, that uh, is not being used to raise money as much as Pick, assigning spectrum in an auction to people who will use capital to go deploy networks uh, could be actually net net a highly positive thing, uh, not just for the, the, the cities and urban areas, but rural areas as well. So governments get to decide how spectrum is assigned and what you're trying to incentivize. 
And industry is great in terms of responding to incentives. So just think, be thoughtful about what incentives you're creating uh, by um, allocating spectrum and right of way in a way that uh, that allows that uh, resource to be used to deliver service. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I know that I have to give the final kind of minute to Samantha, but maybe you want to hear very few, a couple of last words from Paul, Elizabeth, or Ida, if you want. Any point, any final remarks from anyone? Yeah, of can, you? Just, just oh, a minute. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think, I think we are actually in a really amazing moment. Um, and, you know, I've been, I've been in this space for a few decades and seen things come and go. And um, I think right now what's, what's incredibly exciting is just the, the panoply of, of different technological solutions, different ways of tackling this challenge. We, you know, five years ago, fi fixed wireless was not as mature as it is today. And there weren't as many options available, uh, and it's it's definitely much more scalable. Now we have low Earth orbit satellites. We have a whole bunch of um, other technologies that are that are available. So I think I think the technologies are now readily available, um, and there are a lot of different options that are out there, including free space optics and other cool things. So I, I think I think that's not so much the challenge anymore. The challenge are some of the other barriers that we talked about, like access to financing and and, and regulation and, and those kinds of issues. That's it for me. Very good. Thanks, Paul. I think we're running out of time. Uh, uh, Elizabeth, Ida, maybe one last word just to uh, give you the opportunity to say bye. I I would just say thank you, um, and we need to keep up the advocacy for this very important topic. Um, thanks. Keep thanks it on the radar. Of the developers, Ida. No, same. I think I'm talking as a person that's coming from a developing country. I think technology connectivity for us has to be meaningful. We don't have to decide between buying bread and access to the internet. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Vin. Thanks, Milo. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thanks, Paul. And thanks, Ida. Samantha, back to you. Thank you. Thank, and thanks to Slim and all of our panelists. That was an amazing session. I don't know about you, but I learned a lot. Um, there, uh, I want to also add an extra special thanks to the Internet Society for being our streaming partner for this event series and enabling so many to join us today from around the world. So thank you so much, ISOC. Um, I can't believe how much we learned. Uh, Milo, you went over about you know, the infrastructure and the interaction between spectrum and, and base stations and how that uh, you know can in, invent you know how many how many uh, pieces of the network we need to keep track of. That was so amazing. Um, Paul, talking about ESG investing, I am going to be Googling that immediately after this session so I can learn more. Um, and Elizabeth, I, I think that you, you, know, you said some great things and, and Ida about the perspective from developing countries. Thank you so, so much for everything that you added. For those of you who have not yet registered and have joined us through our streaming um, portals, we encourage you to register for the full event at the marconisociety.org forward slash decade. If you have not done so already, please do so. Um, we're going to keep the conversation going by attending our next session. Uh, we're going to have that again tomorrow. So same, same time, same place. Um, we look forward to seeing you. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.